I, I'm, I'm really trusting God today that God would uh, take this message that I have, I feel from the Lord for you, and, uh, and, and kind of make it a, a foundational message for your life. That there's something that I'm saying today that I think will, will shape some of the foundations of your life and you will remember. One of the reasons why I have an exercise bike on stage is that often uh, when I preach, you may not remember anything I say, but remember that guy who wrote the, ex you know, it'll, it'll make the connection in your head. You remember some of the things that I did, which hopefully will remind you of some of the more important things of what God wants to deposit into your life today. Uh, Corin sends her greetings. She actually just came back from Cape Town with my daughter, setting her into uh, accommodation that she's taking up next year. That was just why she couldn't be here. But she does send her love and greetings, particularly to all the ladies uh, who were part of the ladies' event that happened a little while ago. I've been recently asked, um, what are my primary concerns for the church? It's kind of been a bit of a theme of some of the conversations I've had with people over a little while, particularly with leaders. And uh, this is church in general. This is not you uh, this morning. But if you've been around my preaching for a little while, and, and you guys have, I've been here a few times now, uh, you will have heard the call in my message. Uh, I think this call, this challenge of, uh, of the, 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 the gospel in my messages to you over a period of time. It's almost like, remember, I, I keep saying my job is to pour in the concrete. It may not be the, the, the nicest part of the job, but you should hear the cement truck backing up again this morning. And, and pouring some concrete into your foundations, which I think are absolutely critical to our future, to our growth, and to our health as local churches. Um, I have two main concerns for the church, uh, which I want to remind you of today. And the first is that the gospel some churches preach saves no one. That's a big concern of mine. And the second concern I have is that the gospel we subscribe to at times has no power in it for us to live godly lives. We, we are left mostly to our own devices trying to live out this expression of Christianity that we have. And uh, I want to focus my attention on that second point today. But with regards to the first concern that I have, let me just say a couple of things. I want to say this is unfortunately rife. The idea that the gospel that is being preached in many churches does not save anybody is unfortunately rife all around our cities, including yours. If you just take a drive down through the main street of Edenville, you will notice multiple churches, many of which preach a gospel that is focused upon the manipulation of people to be great adherents and good givers in the church. And so the gospel that is being preached is a gospel that tries to cajole people into a space where they become good members and they become generally good givers. The, I call it the, the bless up to bless down problem. In other words, you are all called to bless up in the system, make sure that the leaders and the system is taken care of so that God can bless you. Nowhere in the scripture does it indicate that that's how the gospel should be preached. But it is a gospel preached throughout 80% of the churches of our city. It's a massive problem, and it gives me great concern. In fact, it should stir us on, even this community, it should stir us on to plant churches. You say, well, why are we, you know, there's so many churches around. Why are we planting churches? Because we want to preach the gospel. We want to preach the gospel as it is preached in the New Testament. Without the, the little hooks and things that tries to manipulate people, we want to preach the gospel as it is shared in the, in, in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly discerning him who has called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, this is Paul talking about the apostles, one angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. Even if an angel comes and preaches to you a gospel that is contrary to the gospel preached in the New Testament, may he be accursed. You can see why I'm concerned um, for the church. This is what's so bad about this gospel that's being preached, is that we add requirements to the gospel. We add things in. 
You, can, you, you, you need to be great, but, but you also need to. You also need to give. And the moment we say those words, we have a gospel that's different to the gospel that's preached in the New Testament, preached by Christ. It adds just one requirement. Here, in the New Testament, they added just circumcision to it. But the gospel being preached across our city is a gospel that adds multiple requirements to your Christian life. That if you want to be a good Christian, if you want to do this thing right, you must do these things. You must be a great adherent. You must give money. You must bless. You must do stuff. Then God can bless you. Nowhere in the New Testament. May every person who preaches that gospel be accursed. Why? Because if you add one thing to the gospel of Christ, just one, the gospel doesn't save anymore. It's a heteros gospel, another gospel. It doesn't save anybody. Am I saying that there are many people in churches here around, even your part of the city, that are not saved because they are adherents to this gospel? I, I fear for that. I know that there are many people who are saved in multiple of those churches, but I fear that the gospel we preach is not saving anybody. You can see my grave concern. Why should we be on a church planting mission from heaven, constantly reaching into our cities because of this? This is the problem many times for believers. And here comes my message this morning. Is that... Forgive me for a minute. There's a problem with props, right? They only work when they work for you. Give me a second. All right. The problem with many of us is that we put in lots of effort. And so when we are living out our Christian life, we're putting in a big effort to kind of do the right thing and live godly lives. And, 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 and the problem is the effort the effort we put in doesn't take us anywhere. It's, it doesn't produce any kind of results for us. And I watched this happen for Christians all around the world. We're not unique. It's not that our effort is somehow uniquely poor. No, no. There are Christians all around the world putting in massive effort, trying to be, live godly lives and do the right thing. And, and it's, like, it's like the big effort that they produce is actually not giving them any forward momentum at all. It's like sitting on an exercise bike, putting in all the effort, but you've you got the same view all the time. The same view of your own struggle, the same view of your own battle of your Christian experience. I want to help you today. I want to help you connect your effort to the wheels. I want to help you connect the effort that you put in, in God, under God, the sense that you want to serve His purpose, but that you're not, your efforts are not fruitless, like me riding the exercise bike. I, the, the, the Scripture speaks of the gospel as a mystery. Have you ever wondered why Paul keeps talking about the gospel as a mystery? Does that not befuddle you every now and again? I'm thinking... Mystery? Yeah, no, I understand. It's for all those unbelievers out there. To them, it's a mystery. They don't get it. So, so you know, we, we got it. Well, my concern is that Paul's not talking to the unbelievers out there. He's talking to Christians. And to Christians, it's a mystery. In other words, there are some elements of the gospel that are veiled to believers. They don't get it. Don't understand it. And the problem with that lack of understanding is that it produces a disconnect between the effort, the passion, the desire, and the actual momentum of Christians' lives. They lost that connection. They lost the, the power cables. There's, the, there's the, the thing that the Lord said this morning. You know, here's the power station, but we've lost the, the connection between the power that's available to us and the actual lives that we live. I want to reconnect the cables today for you. Ephesians 3 8 says this. For, to me, Though I am the very least of the saints, the grace, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known 
to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. In other words, there is a mystery in the gospel that needs to be made known to us. We need to know it. We can't be these Christians constantly making effort to do this thing, but it's not working for us. There's no power to do the Christian life. You are trying hard to pray, but it's not working. You're trying hard to read the scripture, but that's not working for you either. And so most Christians that I meet live with a slight sense of disappointment that their effort does not equal the result that they're after. And the problem is not in the effort or in the desire for the result. The problem is that the effort's not connected. The understanding is missing. The mystery of the gospel has not been revealed to you yet. And it needs to be revealed. It is critical for the gospel's power to be revealed to us. The gospel gives power to the ones that live in its foundational principles. The problem is we end up not living in its foundational principles. Therefore, we have no power. We're powerless. 2 Timothy 3.5 says these words, Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. And then it says an odd little statement, avoid such people. Paul's speaking to believers. He says, there are, there are people amongst you that they're, they're haters, they're gossipers, they, they do all sorts of strange things and have all sorts of strange behaviors. They are, they are uh, having the appearance of godliness. They seem to do the right thing, but what? They have no power. They're trying to live the Christian life. There's no power to live it. So they have this strange thing going on where, where strange expressions of ungodly things come up in their lives. And, and you wonder, what's going on? They have no power. Avoid such people. Because when we miss the foundations, you work with maximum effort for no result. We operate in our own discipline, in our own ability. And I somehow suspect that when we operate in our own ability, our own discipline, God leaves us to our own devices. He so, says, well, over to you then, buddy. You have a go. Do your own thing. You know, you, you, you want to have a go? You want to do this? Well, then, then do it in your own power then. Um, I don't think I'm, I'm not disciplined enough to do this in my own power. I'm an, I'm, I, 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 don't you despair at your own discipline sometimes? You know, I was sitting next to someone at the equip, and he, he happened to pour out some sweets. Now, I'm not eating sweets at the moment. But he put out a whole packet of sweets on the chair right next to me. And he says, Pete, just help yourself. And I think, I have an iron will. My discipline is I. No. <laughs> it, it wasn't. I succumbed. I reached across the seat and took one. And one became two. And two became three. My iron will dissipate it. I'm disappointed at my ability to hold out. Aren't you at times? You see, we, there's a disconnect sometimes. And when we're operating in our own discipline, you quickly realize that you are not as disciplined as you think you are. I gave the example of my first car, uh, my Fiat. Who, I lost my first motor. I dropped all the oil of that car on the road somewhere between Durban and Hillcrest. And the car completely seized. And so I decided I need a new motor. I bought a new motor, put the new motor in this car, and after much trouble, it took me about a week. I didn't know much about motors. I learned a lot in two weeks. And I took the old one out, put the new one in, connected all the stuff that needed to be connected, and then tried to start it. Couldn't start it. And, and, and eventually, I got my father-in-law to pull me with his tractor down the road, this little road in Hillcrest, pulling me down the tractor. And eventually, I got the car started. It was, it was noisy. It, was, it, was, it wasn't the sweetest running sound I'd ever heard. But I thought, oh, the timing's a little out. We can fix that later. I rode it home, and I parked it next to my little cottage where I was living. And um, I then went out the next morning to start it, and I cranked the motor over a couple of times. <laughs> Nothing happened. A few more times, and then a massive noise. Whoa! I thought, oh, that did not sound good. <laughs> and I, I get in, and I look, and I think, it didn't look like anything was wrong. And so I, I, I took out one of the spark plugs, Kind of the first thing to check what's going on. I took out and, and I realized there was water at the end of the spark plug. Well, that's never a good sign if you know anything about motors. And there I put that back. I took the head gasket off. I took the top of the motor off. And I looked, to my surprise, one of the pistons was missing. <laughs> Completely. 
completely missing. They had sold me a motor without a piston. I rode home on three pistons, not four. How the motor even started, I don't know. And the crankshaft was riding up and down inside the thing without the actual piston on it. And now, the next morning when it was cold, the crankshaft had gone right through the side of the motor and all the water had filled into the sump. So, I mean, this was the motor over. I feel a little bit like sometimes Christians are riding around missing a piston. Like there's a disconnect. There's a lot of effort going in. There's a lot of things, moving parts, a lot of happening. But the piston's missing. You, you, you're missing the key ingredient to make this thing work. And it's critical that we get the key ingredient right. 1 Corinthians 3.10 says, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, Paul talking, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds on it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will be manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. How many of you here want to just make it? Nobody. I just creep in by the skin of my teeth. I don't know about you. I, I, I mean, I want to I wanna fly. I, I do. I, I, want, I want this thing. I want it to work. I don't want to be putting in massive effort and going nowhere in my life. Building wood, hay, and straw is always likened to self-effort in the Bible. Your effort. Putting in this. Guess you just get burnt up and you're left with just skin of your teeth stuff. You know, I just made it in. How does that make any sense for us? We do not want to live in that place. So here's the message for you. Second half. For a Jew, the feast was central to their lives. And there were seven feasts in the Jewish calendar. And the word feast is the word necra. In the original language, which is also translated rehearsal. It's a strange thing. So the feasts were really a rehearsal for something to come. It was an expression of something that was still up ahead. So the feasts that Israel, the nation, do really rehearses a picture of Christ, of the church. Now at the end of September, or at the beginning of October, is the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. Now, this is a 10-day-long feast, a 10-day-long celebration, a period of self-examination. We're right in it right now. They're in it right now. This would culminate in the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur would kind of stop it. So 10 days, a couple of days from now, Yom Kippur begins. And at that particular point, uh, you're up to speed with Leviticus chapter 16. That's kind of where the story begins. And I'm not going to read Leviticus 16 because that's going to take us a long time. But I am going to commentate on this amazing story. The priest would have to cleanse himself before he made an offering for the people at the end of the self-examination and the Day of Atonement. And he would have to go before God, look after himself, and God would make a point of wanting him clean. You wouldn't want the priest going in with the sacrifice on behalf of the people for their sins. You wouldn't want this guy putting a few back the night before and be rejected by God. So the tradition says that someone sat with him the whole night to keep him, awa keep him awake so that there would be no kind of problems with him. They also had a spare wife in case his wife died overnight and they would marry him quickly so the smell of death would not be on him. Literally, it's what they would do. They would make sure that this guy was sorted. There were two goats that were chosen for the sins of the people. One to cover the sin of the people and one to remove the sin of the people. This is the, the, where you get the word, this is the Azazel, the scapegoat. The one that removes the sin of the people. This is all part of the ceremony that was going on at this particular time. 
Obviously, there's some magnificent picture, language here about Jesus Christ being our Azazel, our scapegoat, going out of the city. Understand what happens here, and it will bring liberty to you. Psalm 103, verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Hands were laid upon the Azazel, upon the scapegoat. In fact, they would even tie a little red ribbon around its neck. And then they would, they would place the sin of the people upon the goat, and they would give it to a Gentile. I guess no Jew would touch this goat. This was one loaded goat. <laughs> And they would take the goat and, and, and lead the goat out the city. And, and the idea was that they would leave the goat in the wilderness. But, but that would be too risky because, man, if this loaded goat landed up eating grass in your backyard, you can imagine how that would be a massive problem. And so they would just gently shove it off a cliff, make sure it never arrived back to Israel again. And, 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 a, and a Gentile would take it out of the city and, 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 and kill the goat outside of the city. Again, magnificent pictures of Christ being taken outside of the city. Our scapegoat, our Azazel, taking upon himself all of our sin and dying outside of the city walls of Jerusalem. While this is going on, the blood of the goat and the bull was sprinkled upon the altar seven times, it says in Leviticus. Why seven? Oh, it's the perfect number. Ah, maybe but why seven? Because actually Christ accomplishes seven acts in his death. Did you know that? You see, when something drops into our hearts about the work, the accomplishments of Christ, suddenly the effort that we put in is connected to the wheels and we have momentum because there is a reliance upon the finished work of the cross and we're not relying upon ourselves. There is a connection. So I want to I tell you the seven theological words of what Christ has accomplished upon the cross. Now, now, you're not theologians, so I will explain them. I'll try and make them simple for you. But the first is expiation, which is, He removed my sin from me. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we, may be, we might become the righteousness of God. My sin is removed. I, you're not a sinner anymore. The sin that typified your life has been removed in Jesus Christ from you. Yeah, yeah. Something, you know, the Bible says, this is what it says in Ephesians, and, I, and I haven't, I'm quoting it now. It says, uh, Paul praying, may the eyes of your understanding, may your eyes be opened up to the mystery of the gospel. Because when you get the mystery of the gospel and understand what Christ has accomplished on the cross, suddenly the power cable connect with the power station. And you're not left to your own devices, trying to grit your teeth and hold on and be good. There's no power in that. There is only power in this finished work. And when you get it, when the concrete has been poured into your foundation, suddenly you have power to live the Christian life. And movement is possible. My sin is removed from me. I am a sinner no more. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's who I am. The blood was sprinkled seven times upon the altar. The second sprinkling of the blood upon the altar at the Day of Atonement is propi propitiation, propitiation, taking God's wrath. Christ took God's anger upon himself. God is not angry with me anymore. I, some of you, something happens in your life. Some, the wheels come off in some place and you think to yourself, Oh, I must have done something. Some, some, something happens, maybe sickness. Or I must, or I must, I must you know, I've I, I got to hang in there because God, God wants to see my contrition and then maybe He will answer me with healing. No, 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 no. God is not angry with you anymore. Your Azazel, Christ, took upon Himself all, all, not some, all of God's anger towards your sin. 
He took all of God's wrath. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, to pay the price for God's anger. That all the anger of God would be meted out upon his son, upon the Azazel, upon the scapegoat, so that you and I could go free. We are free. God's anger does not burn against us anymore. He does not look at you and think, oh, God's unhappy with me today because I kicked the cat on the way out the door. And I said something to my wife I should not have said on the way to church. No, 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 no. The anger of God no longer burns against you. Because Christ has in himself taken all the anger of God upon himself. The third act of Christ upon the cross is redemption. He bought us out of bondage. Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I was in bondage to sin. My life was in bondage. I, I thought I was free before I came to Christ. But I only realized that actually I was, in, I was a slave to a life, a way of living, a way of thinking. And only when I came to Christ did I realize my slavery. Did I realize that I was up on the market, block, sold to the highest bidder of this world. But in Christ, he comes and says, I want him. Me. You. And he pays a price. He buys you for himself. That upon the cross, he pays the ultimate price for your life. And says, I want him. He chose us, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, before the foundation of the world. He picked us out for himself to be his, to be his children, to belong to him. And so when we came up for sale, on the slave market of the world, Christ himself with his own blood pays a price and says, I want him. I want you, sir. I picked you. Do you not think he can hold you? Do you not think he can keep you when he paid such a price for you? Do you not think he can empower you to live the Christian life? See, when we constantly lean into ourselves and our own ability, we are left to our own devices. But when we lean into the finished work of the cross, there is power, power to live this Christian life. We have been redeemed. We have been redeemed. We have been bought out of bondage. Number four, we have been justified. We have been declared guilt-free. Acts chapter 13 and verse 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. And by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. You are free. You are guilty no more. I, wanna, I want you to know that there was a case against me in heaven. And the declaration over my life was guilty. Guilty. Nothing I could do. Even, even my goodness, even the good things I've done with my life were never good enough. I, when, when the grace of God dawned on me, you know what I cried? I cried for two hours. I was a believer. I'd been a believer my whole life. I, I gave my life to the Lord at three, four, five, and six. Every children's camp I ever went to. I, I, I grew up in the church. I grew up under the front row of the church. But one day, at the age of about 24 years old, I'm sitting in my lounge and the eyes of my understanding open and I weep. You know why I weep? I realize that even my goodness would, would never bring God's eyes on me. Never. He would never turn and look at me. That all my goodness, all the good things about me, and I, I can tell you the worst testimony of my life is that I, I, smoked a, I smoked a pipe when I was 16 years old. And I'll have some worse things going on in my head, I'm sure. 
But, but I, I didn't have a big set testimony. I, you know, I did drugs and I drank too much and I, I you know, beat up my wife. I don't have testimonies like that. But nothing of my goodness, nothing of my church service and teaching children's ministry at the age of seven, that's when I began to teach in kids' ministry. None of that stuff was any good. It never accounted any positives to my account. Or oh, little pluses, you know, God added. Or oh, uh, him, or oh, Pete, I want him. No, no, no. All of that stuff all counted in the negative column. All that goodness. I always thought, that's a pretty nice guy. And the declaration over my life was guilty. And I wept. I wept. You know, I wept over my own struggles. And I wept because I knew in that moment that God did not choose me for anything I had done. He chose me because of what Christ had done. It, 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 when, it, when it drops into your heart, you realize the power to live this Christian life comes from His work, not yours. There was a legal case opened against me in heaven and a guilty verdict and death was written over it. Death was the result. But Christ paid the price for my guilt and He took my guilt away. I am guilty no more. Oh, Peter, I do some bad things. I want to tell you, I think some bad thoughts. I do some bad things at times, but I am guilty no more. It's a product. It's a memory problem with the old nature. But I am guilty no more. You know, you know those of you that go to the gym regularly, I'm going to speed up now. I've got 10 minutes left. But those of you that go to the, the gym regularly, you know, you, you, they tell you about something like muscle memory. You know, you can't keep doing the same exercise over again. Because you must kind of break out of it a little bit because your, your muscles just, you know, they get to know that and then you're not exercising them anymore. That's what they tell you. That's what I'm told. You have sin memory. You know, you start stepping down into a certain place and, 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 and the memory kicks in. But I want, I want to tell you right now, lean into the, lean into the free verdict of heaven. And the memory, the, the, the processes of your life, so, something gets undone in you. You begin to lean into the grace of God, and there is power there. If you try and not do sin, God bless you. You're on your own. But when you lean into the, 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 the justified work of Christ, when you lean into the, the, the guilt-free verdict from heaven over you, suddenly you begin to live in a nature. Suddenly, the effort that you have connects to the chain, to the wheels, and you are moving. Because there's power there. There is no power in your own effort. And most Christians are left in their own effort and to their own devices. I want to make sure that does not happen to the New Day Church. You want to live in the power of God. You want your devotion, your life with Him, to be connected to the source. Number five. Remember there were seven, so I've got a few more. Sanctification, set aside for, for sacred use. You have been set aside. Hebrews 10, 12 says, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until His enemies should be made a footstool for His feet. For by a single offering He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified, those who are being set aside for holy use. You have a purpose. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how many numbers you have behind your name. It doesn't matter how successful you are. How many rands you have in your bank account. You have been set aside, sir. You've been set aside, man. You're his. You have a holy purpose for heaven. Because when Christ pays a price for you, he buys you and he sets you aside for holy use. It doesn't matter how smart you are, how great you are. He sets you aside. He wants to use you. His purpose and plans are unlocked through your life. I am a saint. Not one day. I am a saint now. <laughs> you know, you know when, the, when you come to the queen and she wants to give you an honor, you know, the, the sword, the old days, you know, the sword goes on the one shoulder, the other, you know, Sir David Rice. The sword of heaven is coming out and touching your shoulders. Saint, holy man, holy woman of God, you are his. 
saint, set aside for holy use. You are his vessel. You are his. He, he, he ordains you. He calls you into his purpose and into his plan. He set you aside. He declares you his. You are his. Two more. We are reconciled. Reconciliation. Restored to full relationship with God. Romans 5.10 For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received reconciliation. What was lost in Adam is restored in Christ. I want to say this to you. I said it to the equip. God wants to walk with you again in the cool of the day. He wants to walk with you in the garden. So many of us have lost the garden. We're so busy with our lives because we do not recognize the finished work of the cross restores the garden to every believer. He says, I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want to walk with you in the garden again. But the garden is lost to believers. We're so busy in our own efforts that we lose the idea that we've been reconciled to Christ. He wants to walk with you. Would you take some time, maybe even this afternoon or tomorrow morning, and just as an act of worship or whatever it is you do, sit down, have a cup of coffee, and, and just spend some time in the garden with the Lord. Or go out into your garden, your physical garden, if you have one, and go and just pace around the garden a little. Don't pace, walk. God walked in the garden and said, Adam, 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 where are you? I wonder whether God's call to find us in the garden is still going on. Because we haven't understood that we've been reconciled to God. You are His. You have a unique connection with Him. This is not about discipline to try and connect. Oh, I need to grit my teeth, hold on, because I need to connect with God. No, 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 no. You've already been connected with God. All you need to do is go walk in your garden. I'm not talking about your physical garden, the garden of the Lord. Go connect with Him because the connection has already been accomplished in Christ. It's been done for you. You are connected with Him. Number seven and the last one is regeneration. He gave us new life. Romans 6, 1 to 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of, you, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. The very life that we need to live is the life provided in Jesus Christ. It's been provided. It's been done. You have been regenerated. You have been made new already. In other words, as I said earlier, sin is a memory problem. It's in your past. As far as the east is from the west, so far, we read it earlier, so far does he remove your transgressions from you. They're in the past. Dig deep graves. Die properly. Sometimes I wonder whether when people go into baptism, we should hold them down a little longer. It wouldn't hurt. Die properly. Let the memories fade into the past. Why? Because we have been regenerated. We have been made alive. We have a new life to live. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It is what Christ has accomplished for you. You used to be another species. Now, you have been recreated. That's the idea that Paul is bringing out. You used to be a pig. Now you're a sheep. I'm just using that analogy. And when sheep go and roll in the mud, it's a mess. It's a mess. Why? Because they weren't made to roll in mud. Pigs were made to roll in mud. They roll liberally. They love mud. But you're not a pig anymore. You're all together new. And so go roll in the mud. It's a problem. It just hangs on you. It's a problem. You were made new. You're another species. 
You're all together recreated, regenerated with new life. You were not made for that life. You were made for this life. You were recreated in Christ, regenerated to live a new life in Christ. When the truth of the finished work of the cross really drops into your heart. So many Christians are peddling away, trying to do the right thing for God. <laughs> and it's hard work. Giving and all the things you must do. You can't remember them all. There's no power for them. Because they're not leaning into the finished work of the cross. Jesus Christ, our Azazel, our scapegoat, the Day of Atonement is two days away for the Jewish people. Reminding them that it's been accomplished. It's done for you. You don't have to have effortless or full of effort Christianity that has no impact upon your life and no outcome. Connect the effort with the wheels in the finished work of the cross. Begin to lean into what Christ has done for you. And I want to tell you, it changes everything. Everything. Everything for you. The eyes of your understanding would be open. 